I think uh, everyone's all uh, giddy about being outside, even with uh, masks. So, um, my name is David Reed. I'm president of the Board of Trustees. And thank you all so much for being here. Uh, thanks to the staff, thanks to Annie and Anya, and thanks to my fellow trustees who I see uh, around. So we're gonna have a, a great uh, presentation for you this morning. It won't be too long. Um, but I also want to thank, we're going to bring up uh, Tiffany and Mike uh, in a few minutes to say a few words. So I'm a resident of Topsfield, uh, formerly of Salem, and have been involved with Essex Heritage now um, for over 10 years, and it's very, very passionate to me. We are in uh, one of the Brad, the Brad Street Farm, which is the, I'm not going to steal the thunder, but it's the second oldest working farm in the country. And um, as many of you may know from your history, the Bradstreet family, Simon Bradstreet was the first governor of Massachusetts back in the 1600s under the British crown. So we are in a very historical um, place. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, I also want to um, uh, welcome a few uh, people uh, of our elected representatives. We'll do that in a few minutes. And also, I never miss a chance to give a shout out to the Border to Boston Trail, which is a, a Essex Heritage Initiative. And one that really in the last couple of years has had so much movement. Um, and uh, you may have got a Border to Boston Trail map in your uh, mail recently, but it's a 70 mile trail from the New Hampshire border all the way to Boston, and it's almost complete. We have a couple of gaps that we're working on, um, and I want to give a shout out to Bill Steelman, who's kind of the godfather of the border to Boston trail. <laughs> from Danvers, who's helped, and Ingrid Barry, who uh, is also, Laura, uh, Ingrid celebrated her 59th wedding anniversary uh, recently on the trail with her bike with her. <laughs> and and uh, the head of the Topsfield Rail Trail, Joe Geller, is here, so thank you very much. So first, uh, Tiffany and Mike, can you come up and uh, tell us about your great your great facility Sorry, here. we're the weird ones hiding behind the door. No, 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 you guys are keeping the trains running. Yes, yes. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Tiffany. This is Mike, and welcome to Bradstreet. We are very, very thankful to have you guys here. A little bit of a push-out schedule a year later, but we're happy to have you here nonetheless, and hope that you'll come back and visit us at another time, too. Um, we are, as you just mentioned, the second oldest continuously working farm in the United States, and we've done a tremendous amount of work here on the property to maintain as much of the history and the integrity of the property all while keeping it um, accessible for new generations here to come. So Mike is the one that actually saw this place um, before what you see here today. Looked a little different. Raccoons were very happy in the main farmhouse with six feet of water in there as well. This place was actually falling off. We could see daylight and you could come stargaze if you wanted to. Um, so a tremendous amount of work has gone in here, but all while maintaining the history of it, not every, having it get lost. So you wanna talk a little bit about what you did? Cause this was well before my time. Uh, I was able to purchase this around 2011. It is sat vacant for six or seven years. As Tiffany mentioned, this pot was virtually non-existent and falling off. It's on the National Register, so we have a lot of rules and regs uh, to follow to build this. Everything on the inside of this building and barn, as well as everything on the outside of this building and barn, has to go through rigorous rules and regulations, plans, drawings, designs, and architects. Everything you see here has to be approved by somebody. Um, and then once I got it stable, um, I embarked on a way to how do you take this property and, and um, keep it for years to come and not just hide it away down the end of the long driveway. So um, I found Tiffany, she is uh, well respected and revered in her, in her profession. And uh, I contacted her and had her over here and it didn't look like this. And I said- <laughs> It was a lot of convincing to be done, to be honest. Uh, how can we take this and what do we, what, what can we do to create something that, it, that will allow people to come here and at the same time maintain historic and, and its heritage of uh, hundreds and hundreds of years. 
So we came up with this idea, and together we restored and rebuilt it so people can come and use it. A lot of the fields that you see here, the property, we're doing a, farm, uh, a majority of farm to table inside this property. So the flowers, uh, the crops, I work with all local farmers who don't have land, but they'll use our land because we have lots of land. And, uh, and most recently, you'll look out the backyard, uh, we teamed up locally with Mill River, who is a local vineyard, uh, who um, were maxed out their vineyard, and they needed more grapes to, again, as, as we try to do, is we try to source local and, uh, and protect the future of farmers all in, in, our, in our general area. So we teamed up with Mill River, and uh, that's why you see a large expanse of Marquette grapes in our backyard. Next year, weather permitting, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, plenty of rain, we will have, we'll be bottling our first bottles of wine uh, about a year and three months from now. And that's, uh, we're excited, and again, we're working all locally with farmers um, to use our property and to, and to service everybody. So that's really what we enjoy. Uh, we open this up to the public, and by opening the, uh, to, for people to come and to preserve and protect the heritage it was just really important for us not to let this property go to condos, I'll be honest, I'll just be frank. Um, we didn't want to have this developed. We wanted to maintain this. It wasn't the um, most cost-effective way of doing this property, uh, but we certainly saw the future of it, and we understand that we're really just the stewards of it. This is just our property for a little bit of time, and certainly at some point we'll be handing it off to the next generation, the next generation. So it was really, really important for us to maintain this, keep this, and do everything in our power to save it. Um, so we're really happy for you guys to be here today. If you have any questions or anything, reach out. Um, you can send a carrier pigeon, go through Twitter, our website, Facebook, wave at us. Um, we'll get in touch with you if you have any questions or you want to bring people by to show off. We're always happy to show off the place. So thank you so much. Enjoy your time here today. Thank you so much, Tiffany and Mike. And, um, Historic preservation is a big part of what Essex Heritage does and stands for is one of our, our principles. So uh, we appreciate this. Uh, another similar farm in Topsfield and something similar, Pierce Farm up in Witch Hill. So, um, and we appreciate all the efforts. Okay, so now we are going to go from homemade wine, or the future of it, to the business portion of our meeting. So sorry. Okay. Elected officials, we have um, Brad Hill, which we're going to um, bring here and thank him for his service. And we have uh, Mayor Holiday from Newburyport, who we're going to thank her for her service, and Jenny DiZaglio. So we want to thank all of you guys for being here. And is there any other elected officials that we might have missed? Um, so thank you all. Why don't you come up and say a few words if you'd like? Go ahead, Jenny. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I just want to say thank you because I have uh, gotten Denise, Donna, Debbie, Diane, but never Jenny. <laughs> so I appreciate that. Um, my name is Diana DiZaglio. I am a local state senator <laughs> in the Maranac Valley. Thank you. Um, and uh, it is truly my honor and privilege to be here today. Thank you so much to everybody at Essex Heritage. Uh, we so appreciate the work that you do. As a state senator, I've had the opportunity to vote on funding uh, to make sure that all the important work that you do is prioritized in the legislature. Everything alongside Repel, uh, everything from, from the rail trails uh, to the youth programming that Annie and I were talking about that serves so many underserved children in our local communities across Massachusetts. Uh, I do just want to say thank you, and I don't know if Mike and Tiffany are still around, but if they are, I do want to say a huge thank you to them for hosting us all today. Uh, I, alongside of our local officials, had been working with them through the pandemic, and they had a tremendously challenging time, as you can imagine, owning a venue uh, that was shut down for pretty much the entirety of the pandemic. So to see them coming back, and to see you folks in here is just really inspiring. And uh, I do just want to, if we can, just for them and their entire staff, I think they're right up behind that door, just give them a round of applause.
Bradstreet Farm truly is where history meets progress. And I think that they're doing great work here of making sure that they're maintaining the rich culture of this farm and the region and the history that is here and making sure to continue that great work to make sure that it's preserved for future generations to come. So uh, thank you to all of you. Uh, I am uh, actually running for state auditor. So this is my last year as a state senator. It's uh, Rep Hill's last term as a state representative. It's Mayor Holiday's last term as a mayor. There's a lot of transitions going on in this region right now. Uh, but I do have one more budget cycle in the state Senate to vote for uh, and support all of the issues that are so important to all of us. So please feel free to reach out to me, let me know about what your priorities are so that I can support them, so that I can co-sponsor amendments, legislation that's helpful to not just this region, but to your region, wherever you're coming here from as well. And, uh, and working alongside of each other, I think that we can continue to see great things done. And uh, once again, thank you to all of you. I'm Diana Dezoglio, and it's great to <laughs> great to. Term limits for rerunning with Jenny because you're. Yeah. <laughs> we appreciate you. Jen Jenny from the block. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone, for coming out today. Uh, looking forward to the program. I know what you're all thinking, another politician going on forever and ever, uh, but I'll be very brief. Uh, first of all, welcome to the 4th Essex District, uh, one of the most beautiful places in all of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, where we have our Ipswich <coughs> clams and where we have our great beaches and, of course, our great farms. I always push that up on Boston every time I get, uh, I get introduced uh, to somebody because we live in one of the most beautiful areas in the world, never mind the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And one of the reasons that we live in this most beautiful place is because of organizations like this one. Uh, 25 years ago, somebody had a dream. And it was a dream where we were gonna have an organization that was gonna bring together a lot of partners to make sure that our area was put on the map figuratively and of course in reality. And that's exactly what happened. 25 years later, we stand here in this beautiful barn recognizing this organization and the great work that they have done. It's had great leadership, and one of those leaders is right here to my left, Annie uh, Harris. And I want you to know something. When you are a legislator, uh, there's probably thousands and thousands of people that we meet each year, not even in a, in a uh, term, but uh, each year. And there are some people whose names that when they call, you drop everything, you pick up that call, and you take it, and Annie Harris is one of those individuals. She has a red line to every legislator on the North Shore and, uh, and Essex County. And because of that great relationship, as uh, Senator DiZaglio mentioned, uh, we all have worked very hard during the budget process to ensure that we can get you the funding that you need uh, as a part. Uh, it's not all the funding that goes into this organization, it's a piece of it. Uh, and it's because of the advocacy of Annie, uh, but more importantly, because of the relationship with Annie that we have. We love you up on Beacon Hill, uh, and you are one of the people that I'm gonna miss the most, uh, because not only do we talk about Essex heritage, but we talk about all the great things that this organization has done. Not only did it uh, put Essex County on the map nationwide, but it also reached out and partnered with nonprofits to ensure that they got what they needed uh, to ensure that this area uh, was well known, well loved, uh, and I want to thank you personally uh, for the great work that you have done over the years for all of us. This organization is what it is because of you. And on behalf of my colleagues, I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. I will miss you all, love this organization, loved working with you. If you don't know, I'm stepping down next next week uh, to become a commissioner in the Gaming Commission. Um, but this is one of those yearly events that we don't miss because of the work that you do and because of what it represents. Thinking about what this barn was when it was first purchased and what it has turned into today is something that we have seen throughout Essex County. And it's because of the work and the partnership that you have had with all of us. So thank you and to the organization, 
happy birthday or happy anniversary, however we want to we want to look at that. And thank you for being such a great partner with my office over the years. Thank you. Thank you everyone. So now we'll do the business portion of the meeting. And again, uh, there's no um, uh, minutes, but we do have four new trustees that we'd like to announce this morning. Um, and those four new trustees are Angela Warren Ippolito, the Swampscott uh, Planning Board member, and she's a very active community member in town. We have Laura Swanson, who's the Executive Director of the Enterprise Center at Salem State University. And we have Nate Bryant, who's the Vice President of Student Success at Salem State University. And we have Steve Immermill, the past president of Montserrat uh, College of Art. So on behalf of uh, Essex Heritage, um, we want to thank and welcome all of those people. So thank you for being part of this. So uh, welcome to everybody this morning. Uh, some of you have been with us and has been involved in Essex Heritage for many years, and some of you are, I think, are actually fairly new to what we do. So with this in mind, I want to give you a brief retrospective today, uh, 25 years in about 15 minutes. Uh, so here we go. Uh, to begin with, uh, just a little bit of background and how we got started. Uh, in the late 20th century, um, there was a realization uh, among business leaders as well as planners and elected officials that the urban renewal model of clearing away old buildings and constructing new access roads to communities was not always producing uh, the most successful kind of community development and economic revitalization. Uh, and there was awareness that perhaps the preservation and conservationists uh, had a point. Uh, and that the places that were preserved and were celebrated for their unique uh, culture and natural assets uh, often became more successful in attracting new business and new residents. Um, and so as historic preservation and conservation began to gain more support as a valid community and economic development strategy, a new concept began to take hold uh, and within the National Park Service and uh, in within Congress, uh, the idea of creating uh, national heritage areas began uh, to take root. Uh, and four national heritage areas were created during the Ronald Reagan Craig, uh, presidency. Um, and the idea was that fostering public-private partnerships to promote heritage preservation, economic development, was a, was a valid way to deal with uh, large lived-in landscapes. Uh, the process for creating a national heritage area is actually somewhat similar um, to those who are familiar with the process of creating a national park. Um, the natural and historic significance of a place or region uh, must be studied by the Park Service, and if they deem it to be nationally significant, then the boundaries are drawn and Congress must pass legislation for the designation. Uh, there are a couple of crucial differences between heritage areas and national parks in that in most cases uh, national parks uh, have a lot more federal ownership and management whereas a heritage areas of ownership and management are left to local entities um, private ownership is maintained and usually nonprofits are put in or uh, uh, designated as the regional management agencies uh, and they do not have any enforcement powers and cannot impose any restrictions, but work through collaborative partnerships uh, and encouragement. So this idea was uh, it kind of kicked around in Essex County, as I said, in the early 1990s. And it was embraced by a number of civic and business leaders, as well as preservationists and conservationists. It was, again, seen as a way to foster economic development and improve the cultural tourism as well as trying to preserve our common New England heritage. Um, an ad hoc committee was formed in the 1990s, and members included business leaders and public officials from around Essex County, including several mayors, select persons, former mayors, as well as business leaders, 
heads of the, the two major chambers of commerce uh, and representatives of local conservation land trusts. And this group enlisted the help of the congressman from the sixth congressional district and the two set, sitting U.S. senators who at that time were Senator Kennedy and Senator Kerry. Uh, and they were asked to file legislation to designate Essex County as a national heritage area. And the Massachusetts uh, delegation to Congress, especially the senators, readily took up this proposal and four years after the initial filing of the legislation, it passed in 1996. And Essex County was designated a national heritage area. Uh, so when this got started uh, in 1996, we had a fairly simplistic uh, view of the nationally significant history of this region. We saw as three overarching themes, which have been identified by the National Park Service, 17th century early colonial settlement, uh, 18th century maritime history with an emphasis on the period of world trade immediately after the American Revolution, and then the early industrial revolution, which took place particularly along the Merrimack uh, River Valley. These three themes are represented by our logo, which is still in use today. Uh, at the last annual meeting last spring, when we held it virtually last April, I spoke a little bit about how our concept of this history has evolved in the last 25 years, and it's evolved a lot. Uh, but even 25 years ago, as we got started on this venture, we realized that um, Estes County is so much more than the more complex, it's so much more than these three themes, uh, so much richer in its built and in history and in built structures and its environment. And we quickly refocused, and our primary mission became that of engagement. The goal became making the heritage assets of this place more visible, welcoming, and relevant to diverse audiences. And working with the nonprofits, the site managers, like this place, this wonderful place, <laughs> state agencies who own and manage the heritage assets to help them improve access and sustainability of their places. Engagement, we feel, is the only way to ensure that these resources will last into the future. As Tiffany said, we're only temporary holders of these places. So the goal, our goal then and now, is for people to feel the power of this place, and often they do. This was a campaign, one of the fun campaigns we did. Um, so what have we been doing over the last 25 years to foster this engagement? We've tried a number of things from A to Z, and I will give a quick review of some of them today. Some of our programs were short-lived and others have persisted for years. Some of the short-term programs didn't foster enough engagement or we couldn't find sustainable funding for them, while other programs have grown over the years and have become ever more successful. An early program, which was done only once but had, had, has had a significant effect, was the Heritage Landscape Inventory, which Bill headed up. In 2004, we partnered with the Department of Conservation and Recreation to complete an inventory of Essex County's heritage landscapes, or places of the heart. We invited the 34 communities of Essex County to participate, and 24 accepted the offer. The inventory project engaged local residents in the process of defining and planning for the long-term preservation of their community character. We held a series of facilitated meetings with town officials, community planners, conservation commissioners, open space advocates, and gen the general audience, general residents. At these sessions, they got to discuss the places in their community that were really special to them. They got to decide which places did they most want to preserve and conserve into the future. And the resulting plans, published in 2005, have become a roadmap for these communities and for the past 16 years have guided many of their decisions on where to seek grants or where to put their community preservation funds. It has been really remarkable to see the impact of this one study uh, on these communities. Our most successful region-wide community engagement program, I think, has been Trails and Sales, now in its 20th year. It is... <laughs> 
It has grown from one weekend in September to 10 days and more than 200 free events all around the region. The events have included everything from local winemaking to climbing the clock tower at Gloucester City Hall. And we thank the site partners who host these events and the thousands of residents and also visitors who take advantage of Trails and Sales. Uh, this year, uh, Trails and Sales is coming up from Friday, is starting Friday, September 17th through Sunday, September 26th. There are over 200 events, 100 are, are unique, and then some of them are repeated. There are in-person events, do-it-yourself events, and virtual tours. All events are free, but some require registration. There are booklets for this Trails and Sales event, and kudos to Anya for really pulling it off and doing this really beautiful booklet this year. So please take the booklet, and I think we have extra ones. Take them and pass them out in your community. It's really going to be an outstanding event. Um, some of our programs, like Trails and Sales, have grown, but many of our programs have also evolved over time. Um, our education program started with an emphasis on engaging students in their classrooms and at the national parks. This was partly a function of some very good National Park Foundation grants, such as America's Best Idea and First Bloom that happened during the centennial. But over the years, we've also formed partnerships with other organizations, such as this program behind me with, that we did with the City of Lawrence, Essex Art Center, and Lawrence History, Lawrence Heritage State Park, which created this mural. And more recently, projects like the Caribbean Connection, which was a program we created with the House of Seven Gables, and which they now have taken over and run. We have done several programs for English language learners over the years. The purpose was not only to foster their English skills, but also to encourage the students who were recent immigrants to understand the important role that immigrants and immigration have always played in this region and that they are part of this continuum of history. Over the years, we have also created several in-depth online resource guides for educators, including using Essex history, local history in a national context, heritage at home. And, but websites can be difficult uh, to keep updated, and we're ha very fortunate to have recently been able to secure resources to update using Essex history, and we'll continue to, to work on that. But our most substantial and longest lasting educational program, and the one with the greatest impact, has been the teacher a professional development and mentoring program called A Park in Every Classroom, or PEC. As the name applies, it was a program that was originally developed by the National Park Service, and we were initially just a partner with them. But over time, we've expanded and developed it so it reaches teachers in every part of this county. The program is designed to help teachers learn how to use the region's heritage asset in their classroom. Whether it is a trail near their school or a vernal pool, or an historic site or an old farm, these real resources provide powerful ways to engage students in learning activities, from things like calculating the number of microbes uh, in a pond, or the speed of two rowboats rowing dories on the Merrimack River, or learning about local flora and fauna and creating written guides for their communities, open spaces. These have been really powerful learning experiences uh, for the kids and bring in their math and bring in their social studies and bring in their writing skills. For the past 10 years, this place-based model has been transformative for teachers and their pupils. There have also been two other aspects of our education programs which I, which I want to mention. Uh, one is the hands-on learning that we have developed at Baker's Island. During the past few years, we've had a chance to develop several interactive programs with school and camp groups on the island, despite the challenges of, of weather and transportation. Unfortunately, um, these, uh, because of COVID, had, had to be discontinued for the time being, but we hope once this is passed, we'll be able to, to bring them back. Um, and we have been very fortunate, at least this year, to be able to do some of our adult uh, programs, uh, such as the geology along the coast, a shipwreck tour of the actual wreck you can see in Little Misery, um, and, and some other programs. 
Uh, this, the last program, educational program I want to mention is a, a newer one for us, and it's um, talking about uh, more work, the more work that we're doing and delving into the lesser known histories of this region, including indigenous people, African Americans, and immigrant histories. And we're uncovering, with the help of local scholars and educators, many wonderful resources, photographs, and historical documents that help teach these untold stories. This spring, our three virtual workshops for educators were extremely popular, and the work that North Andover High School History Coordinator Brian Shee has been doing with our educational director, Beth Berenger, has really been outstanding. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later uh, during our awards. Um, so while our educational programs have evolved to focus more on teachers and responding uh, to their needs, our work with young people has grown over the years to engage more youth between uh, the ages of 14 and 25 in our Future Leaders program. This is a program, another program, which grew, grew out of our partnership with the National Park Service. Uh, and this is a program uh, that was designed for young people who may be having learning or behavioral or financial challenges that make it difficult for them to secure paid internships. At its most basic, the Future Leaders employs youth for eight weeks during the summer, and they work at two national parks within the heritage area, Salem Maritime and Saugus Ironworks, and also at some of the other historic and open space sites in the region. The youth learn job skills, including carpentry, historic preservation, sign making, and visitor services. They also learn about job expectations and resume writing, and most importantly, we help them develop leadership skills that they learn to manage projects and lead work teams. In addition, we introduce them to civics and community engagement and how to become productive participants in their communities. And we also expose the youth to heritage, the heritage sites of this region, including here is the National Historic Landmark, the Schooner Adventure. And recently, with the help of funding from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, thanks to our elected officials here today and others, we have been able to expand this program and hire some of these young people who want to work during the school year as well. And this is a really a wonderful expansion of this program. Uh, and we're very excited to be working with these young people and with several historic sites in this region to provide them opportunities. I've spoken about our special relationship with the National Park Service, and I, and I believe it's been mutually beneficial in many ways. It has greatly expanded the reach of the two small national parks we have within the heritage area, and it has certainly been a, a, a lot of fun for us to work. And as I've mentioned, there have been several programs that have been started as models in the Park Service that we've been able to pick up and, and expand. Uh, I do want to mention one program uh, that I particularly uh, close to my heart. We're not able to do it right now, but hopefully soon. Uh, and I am referring to the times that we were able to, to sail the tall ship Friendship, which we call the flagship of Essex County. Uh, we took, we had a wonderful time when we took her up to Newburyport. We had, uh, I think, thousands of people that went aboard that three-day weekend. Uh, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, and then we also took her uh, down to Lynn. We were helped to facilitate the park, take her down to Lynn. Uh, and that also was a wonderful experience. Many people living in Lynn didn't really realize that they had a, a, um, a harbor that they could access and that ships could actually come in and they could, and they could visit. Um, but I want to say I, I believe what I've enjoyed uh, most over the years working in the Park Service has been the superintendents that have come to Salem and Saugus. I want to mention Steve Kesselman, Patty Trapp, Paul Dupre. They have welcomed the idea of working beyond their park boundaries with Essex Heritage, and in turn, we have benefited by their expertise and unique perspectives. Now I want to mention another uh, very valuable partnership that Dave Reed alluded to over the years, it's a relationship we've had with the Coastal Trails Coalition, the Board of Boston Rail Trail Advocates, and so many other trail advocates uh, in this region, uh, working to build and create multi-modal off-road trails. Um, 
We, in this case, uh, we have played a more junior role in these partnerships, uh, looking into for ways to support and assist and assist these tireless trail advocates. Uh, as I mentioned, Dave Reed, Trustee Joe Geller, um, Jerry Clymer, for, former Salisbury Selectman, uh, Angela Ippolito, these are just some of the many, many people that have been advocating for more than 25 years for these trails. And Essex Heritage has been very fortunate that at times we've been able to help advocate for funding to advance the trail, and we've been able to bring leaders and advocates together sometimes to resolve issues around rights of way and to get pedestrian and bike access um, designated um, and made it a priority with some of the new bridge construction. And most recently, we have worked with the East Coast Greenway and five Essex Heritage communities to prepare an earmark request uh, that has been submitted by Congressman Seth Moulton for funding in the upcoming federal budget. And we have our fingers crossed that hopefully this will come through and this will greatly help the trail. But when I look back at these slides, it is really remarkable how far these trails have come. There's still more to do, but it's really extraordinary that these, the 70 mile trail from New Hampshire to Boston is gradually becoming realized, and as it becomes realized, it is an integral part of the East Coast Greenway, which is gradually getting built from Canada to Florida. I think that's really an extraordinary effort and, and a lot of credit to so many uh, volunteers that have pushed for this. And there's so many more things that I would like to mention in programs that were done over the years, and which I can't cover today, but regional signage, the purpose of which was to mark this area as a, the special place it is, the scenic byway to bring the attention to the beautiful Atlantic coastline we have, the 13 cooperating visitor centers that give out information to hundreds, thousands of visitors to this region about the heritage of the region, the original explorers program that more recently has, has gone into virtual programming and the field institute that's replacing it, uh, the passport program, photo safaris, annual photo contest, <laughs> just wonderful programs, uh, many of which evolved over time uh, in response to community uh, impact, uh, input and also the changing needs of residents. Um, and along the way, we've also held many interesting events and had a lot of fun. We've learned to make wine and batches of local jelly. We have uh, learned about the meticulous a process of making fine furniture, and here pictured behind me is the really incredible craftsman Phil Lowe, who recently passed away, uh, but it's just extraordinary work in this region. Many other craftsmen we've been able to visit in this region. Uh, we learned how to plant efficient backyard gardens, the value of compost. Uh, we've had visits from historical figures. I think we have Nathaniel and Sophia off on behind me. <laughs> um, and we had some really great parties. Uh, we hosted the Second Century Commission with some of the top brass of the National Park Service. Uh, we had summer soirees. We've hosted a Halloween party. We held a 10th anniversary. We've had a 20th anniversary. Hopefully we'll have a 27th or 30th soon. Um, and we have honored some true uh, regional heroes uh, through our Heritage Hero uh, evenings, including uh, uh, former mayor of Newburyport, Byron Matthews, Maria Miles, and Al Creighton, who are unfortunately no longer with us, but it was really an honor to be able to honor them and, the, and our other heritage heroes. Um, all of this, of course, has been made possible by so many wonderful people, elected officials, um, historians, trail advocates, and just ordinary people who love this place uh, and have worked with us over the years, and I really thank them all, past and present. Uh, there are far too many people for me to really call out today. There's no way I can do it, but I, I do need to mention and acknowledge one special person uh, who aided and abetted me in getting Essex Heritage started, and this is uh, Tom Leonard. Tom was senior vice president of the Salem Five and a really volunteer extraordinaire. He devoted nearly 15 years to nurturing Essex heritage and seeing it become the success it is today. So I really thank Tom um, for, for all he did.
now I have one last series of slides to show a transformation. In closing, I want to show you the transformation at the Baker's Island Light Station. This is the only property that Essex Heritage owns, and it was actually a bit of an accident that we ended up acquiring it. But I believe it has really helped us understand the challenges that owners of historic properties have when they have to maintain and renovate these places. It's really uh, been a, a great help for us to understanding all that goes into working uh, with heritage places. We started working on the Baker's Island Light Station in 2010, and it was in pretty rough shape. The U.S. Coast Guard had automated the light in the early 1970s, and once this was done, they no longer had any personnel stationed at the, on the property. So the assistant keeper's house was particularly in rough shape, uh, with a lot of trash both inside and out of it. Uh, before uh, the U.S. Coast Guard could turn the, prop the deed over to Essex Heritage, they had to remediate the site by removing soil that had lead paint and oil in it. So that took place uh, in about 2012. Uh, fortunately, during that period, we were uh, able to uh, get roofing materials delivered to the site and were able to redo the roofs on the two keeper's houses that were really leaking badly. And once the roofs were watertight, we were able to begin to repair the damaged plaster that had fallen off the walls and the buckled floors. Uh, and then, then you can see today that uh, after several years of a lot of volunteer hours, uh, we really have been able to transform these interiors. The deed to the lighthouse was officially transferred to Essex Heritage in 2014, and then we were able to make much greater strides in restoring the property. Uh, one of the first things we did was hold a fundraiser and a Kickstarter campaign to raise money to restore the lighthouse tower, which was covered with mold and lichen, and the surface was badly damaged by salt and rocks hitting the north side of it during the storms. We had the entire tower repaired, including the lantern room at the top in 2015. To our chagrin, we had to repaint the tower again in 2019, although this time the job was much simpler and quicker, but the pounding storms make it likely that this will be an ongoing uh, maintenance challenge for us. As anyone knows who owns property, especially on a remote island, lots of equipment is needed to manage the property. So we rebuilt the old Jeep shed and uh, made it bigger and better, and now it houses our tractor, mower, and ATV. In 2019 and 2020, with a grant from Green Mountain Energy, we were able to install a powerful new solar power system, and this has transformed our operation on the islands. We can now plug in power tools and have refrigeration to make working and living on the island much more manageable. Another sh new shed was built in 2020. We were very fortunate to have Brandon Reed uh, David's son adopt as his Eagle Stout project, another shed for our campground, and we have since put in uh, solar power so that it can help our visitors uh, recharge their phones and for other purposes. Um, there are always unexpected projects that come along, and the north wall of the main keeper's house was one such project uh, last year. Volunteers were just scraping and doing a quick paint job on the exterior when they discovered extensive rot from water penetration along the whole second story of the building. This again was repaired by some experienced carpenter volunteers, did a fabulous job. In 2015, we were very fortunate to be able to acquire the landing craft Namkeg. The boat has made a tremendous difference in our access to the island since there isn't a dock that we can use and it has enabled us to conduct island tours and have members stay over in the assistant keeper's house and at the campground. And the campground was developed in 2018 and 2019, starting with trustee Matt Pulsiver, who brought his bush hog out on the land and craft. This was one of the more scary things I've ever seen, but it was quite extraordinary. Uh, he, who knew that Nat Pulsiver was a very skilled uh, driver of this large machine that we got on and off and up the, the rocky beach uh, to the island and cleared, and he did the main clearing, which was continued the following year by a lot of volunteers. Um, and now, 
Uh, our campground, it has three campsites, has been, was rated in 2020 by Outdoor Magazine, the best, best campground site in Massachusetts. <laughs> and then just to finish up, uh, this, uh, this year we restored the slate roof on the 1893 oil house, and we continue to improve the small exhibit room in the assistant keeper's house. And while the lighthouse, the light station is still a work in progress, I think you can see that much has been accomplished. And I can't thank again the numerous volunteers and donors who have made this possible. So thank you all. Uh, and now I have the opportunity to recognize at least a few of those volunteers and special, special people. Um, and so first, uh, we always uh, like to try to do a special recognition awards if we can at these meetings and Pioneer Partnership Awards. So I'll start with the special recognition awards. And our first goes to Jim Bosheen, the park supervisor for Lawrence Heritage State Park, who was just recently retired from this post. Uh, Jim was born and raised in Lawrence and he's always been a part of Lawrence's heritage tapestry. With his background in political science and, and law, Jim continued his graduate studies at Northeastern University, where he earned an MA in public history. And he focused on Lawrence's French Canadian community. And for his thesis, he conducted a dozen oral history interviews that are now preserved at the Lawrence History Center's archival collection. And over the years, Jim has, of course, participated in uh, so many events and activities in Lawrence, including he chaired the Bread and Roses Heritage Committee. He has served as a board member of the Lawrence History Center, uh, been active in the, uh, the celebration of the 1912 Bread and Roses 100th anniversary. And he has built his career around preserving the stories of the Lawrence community and finding ways to help residents and visitors alike connect the heritage of his city and this region. Jim has been a great partner of Essex Heritage for many years. He's teamed up on many of our programs, including Trails and Sales, a park for every classroom, and our Hidden Histories um, workshops. At Essex Heritage, we will miss his leadership and guidance in the Lawrence Heritage community but we wish him well in retirement. I hope he will volunteer. <laughs> and I'm very pleased today to recognize Jim for all he has done for Lawrence, the Merrimack Valley, and the Essex National Heritage Area. everybody and uh, I want to thank Andy and everybody at this Essex National Heritage Area who've been great partners over the years uh, very supportive uh, in uh, many of the ways that have been discussed already you uh, didn't have time to mention one of the uh, uh, modes of support which is the partnership grants and the uh, visitor center grants and for those of you like me who have worked in small local historical societies and entities uh, you know that these grants uh, make a great deal of difference to us who, uh, you know, live that hand-to-mouth existence. Um, as Andy says, uh, I am still committed to Lawrence history. I'll still be involved. And so if anybody uh, wants to take a historical tour of Lawrence or have somebody come and give them a talk about uh, Lawrence's history, give me a call, please. Thank you. Now our special Second special recognition award goes to Mayor Donna Holliday. And Mayor Holliday, I'm told, grew up in Marblehead, but I never realized that, but she certainly fell in love with Newburyport and has been there for uh, over 30 years and is currently finishing her third term as mayor. Uh, during her tenure as mayor, she has placed a major focus on addressing long overdue infrastructure and capital improvement projects in the city. She's generated more than $100 million in funding uh, for Newburyport, including two school projects, a new senior community center, central waterfront bulkhead, uh, a roundabout, harbor master boat facilities, and the high school stadium project. 
Mayor Holliday also secured the national designation for Newburyport as the birthplace of the U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, in regards to Essex Heritage activities, Mayor Holliday has always been very supportive of the projects that we have brought to his community. In particular, the Essex Coastal Scenic Byway, a road sign project, and byway kiosks were successfully completed in the northern part of the county with Mayor Holliday's leadership and support. She's also been a champion for the Border to Boston Rail Trail, leading in partnership with Salisbury to ensure that the trail is fully realized in this part of Essex County. We thank Mayor Holliday for decades of public service and all she's done during her tenure as mayor to support and further the goals of the Essex National Heritage Area. It's a pleasure to receive this recognition from Essex Heritage. Uh, it's been a big part of my agenda over the last nearly 12 years as mayor. Our rail trail uh, started out with this picture within the first uh, couple months of my being there and it was just such a joy to be able to do a ribbon cutting uh, a couple months ago where we completed a major section along the waterfront. We ran into problems with our wastewater treatment facility and finding PCBs and we lost Jordy Vining, who was our you know rail trail guru, but I was able to snake him back and bring him back to our community so he could finish our rail trail. We had one section uh, coming across the Route 1 Rotary, and uh, we've been sort of fighting with a push-pull relationship with MassDOT to make that complete, and then working with Newberry on a little strip uh, that has to happen on Parker Street, and then our rail trail would be complete. I'm really, really proud of one of our uh, strongest advocacies, which was difficult when the uh, $300 million Whittier Bridge project was being built, that uh, we wanted a shared use path built with it. And you know, we were showing pictures from other states and we're getting all this pushback from MassDOT about this. And we put out their recent new mission statement. And it was like, are you gonna do this or not? <laughs> So, needless to say, we had uh, support of youth in the area too, and uh, I just want to share one, one uh, story. So we met for years and years on all the studies, all the work, all the efforts that went into building the Whittier Bridge. And so I'm there with all these guys, all these engineers, all of these, you know, listening to studies for all these years, and then we finally finish everything, and it all comes down to the color of the bridge. <laughs> and so, Every person in the room except me wanted that, you know, that brown rusty color that they're doing now on, on bridges. And I was like, we just spent $300 million of taxpayer money on a bridge that you're gonna make look like it's rusted. <laughs> so it took some twisting of arms, but we got to that beautiful blue, which I'm sure you've all noticed. And so they're now calling it Donna Blue. <laughs> I just thought you'd like to hear that story because it was really important for us to get across the Merrimack River in connecting our rail trails. It was a real important piece of this uh, rail trail. Uh, I can't say enough about Essex Heritage. I can remember probably a couple years uh, into being there, we were brought down to Parker River, some person from the budget office in in uh, Washington, do you remember this? And they were coming down talking about, well, we're not gonna fund these programs anymore. And we're like, what? You know, I mean, all you had to do was look at the data, the partnerships, the resources, the tourists, the economic benefits. I mean, it's just, you heard 25 years that just of an agency that just continues to evolve and evolve and evolve and celebrate the wonderful assets, amenities, history, culture that we have in these 34 communities. And I have been so proud to have been part of this for the last 12 years. And I wish you continued success. And uh, Annie has asked me to join as a commissioner after I finish my term. And I am honored to do so to help to continue your work. Now, I'm pleased to come to our two Pioneer Partnership Awards. 
Uh, and the first goes to Heather Barons in Salem Sound Coast Watch. Heather is an eighth grade science teacher at Peabody Higgins Middle School. And a while ago, she enrolled in Essex Heritage's Park for Every Classroom Teacher Professional Development Program. And she became inspired to implement a place-based project focusing on water quality and climate change in Peabody. Uh, to help her with the project, Heather teamed up with Salem Sound Coast Watch, and together they developed a two-year project for students to measure and understand water quality in their community. Under Heather's guidance, students monitored and analyzed water quality in Peabody's ponds through both years, detailing seasonal changes, looking at macroinvertebrates that indicate water quality health, and testing for other changes in pH, salinity, and turbidity. They also looked at the city's industrial history to better understand how this might contribute to the city's water quality challenges. The students also collaborated uh, with a fifth grade class and shared the results and compared research. When COVID shut down in-person learning last year, Heather continued to gather specimens for her students to analyze. With her help, they were able to continue their research, even though it's remote, and they put together a digital brochure about their findings. As Heather has moved into a second year of challenges with COVID imposed restrictions, she has not let this deter her from providing engaging project experiences for her pupils. This time, she has had them focus on local climate change disruptions and the methods for mitigation. Again, she has teamed up with Salem Sound Coast Watch to help her in this endeavor. She has had students meet over Zoom with middle school's landscape designers to understand the design of culverts, rain runoff systems, and gardens and mitigate the effects of water contamination and flooding associated with climate change. Students took close notes of these designs outdoors and tested the efficacy of these systems. And when COVID receded briefly and it was safe to do so, Heather and her students had a celebration of their work at the middle school, and they also invited partners to join in the cleanup effort. So Heather's work in collaboration with Salem Sound Coast Watch truly exemplifies the stewardship ethic and collaborative learning that Essex Heritage promotes through its Pioneer and Partnership Awards. Uh, Heather and is here and is, oh, she's not, Salem Sound Coast Watch. <laughs> okay, would you come up? Um, Heather exemplifies everything that we love to see in the teachers that we work with. So it's unfortunate she's not here, but she's the one in the trenches doing all the hard work with them um, and doing an amazing job. And I have to say that our partnership with Essex National Heritage um, has really helped us carry the work that we're doing in the watershed and the environment through. In fact, I think if it wasn't for Beth, um, we wouldn't have the successful teacher institute that we have as well. And Heather, like I said, she exemplifies everything we love to see. She not only took Beth's program, but she then took our program the following year. And, um, and that's when she learned about the rain gardens that are at the Peabody Middle School and came up with this brilliant idea of testing the water quality before the water goes in the rain garden and then when it comes out and just really showed her students um, the engineering that's there at the new middle school and like Annie talked about with the ponds. It just kind of took everything we hope um, and, and put it over the top. So Maggie would work with her doing the clean beaches and streams program the tributaries in Pivoti, testing the water quality. Um, so the students would learn about what we were doing and then they would do their own tests. Uh, so it was wonderful. And I just have to say that our partnership um, with Essex National Heritage is so wonderful. Not only are we office neighbors, um, but we work on a lot of programs together. You can catch us at the Trails and Sales at Forest River. Um, and working with Charles this year has been really helpful. His um, future leaders learned from Barbara about sea level rise and helped us weed the rain garden at um, Winter Island. And they also have been working on putting stickers on butt bins in Salem. Um, I think that 
that's it. And then there's the <laughs> posters. Go check out the posters at the National Park Visitor Center. Another um, great collaboration project. Lots of great projects. Yeah, it's really wonderful. So thank you for that. Oh, thank you. And so last but not at all least, our HIP award for uh, Brian Sheehy. Uh, and Brian Sheehy is a North Andover High School history coordinator. In the summer of 2020, Brian was contacted by his students via an email titled, Action Needed. Uh, in the aftermath of George Floyd's death and Black Lives Matter's movement, his students demanded changes in their history curriculum to help them understand the roots of racial and social inequities. They wanted to know what caused the turmoil they were seeing every day in the news and why their humanities and history classes did not include these diverse stories. If this had been happening for years, why were they not learning about it? Uh, in response, and even though it was a year of unprecedented challenges with COVID, uh, Brian initiated a vision for a comprehensive teacher professional development program, which aimed at supporting teachers in integrating local histories of traditionally marginalized communities into their teaching curriculum. When Brian approached Essex Heritage with this idea, we were very fortunate with his help to secure a grant from the National Park Foundation. And together, Brian worked with Essex Heritage and numerous community partners, scholars, and museum professionals, as well as the Mass Department of Elementary and Secondary Education and other educators to create three online workshops for educators. These workshops were carried out virtually last spring and early summer, and we explored three largely unstudied stories that are really integral to the history of this region. And these are uh, the Irish and Latino immigration in the Greater Lawrence region, the African American experience in Essex County in the 19th century, and the experience of indigenous people in this area from pre-European contact to the present. These workshops involve extensive primary source research, much of which Brian conducted himself. And his work led to the development of online websites which house scholars' presentations, the panel's discussions, pedagogical resources, and also the students' responses to the curricular ideas based on these hidden histories. The workshops drew more than 160 educational participants and have spawned 40 curricular activities that are now under development. The program also provided a, a space for educators to collaborate and support each other in addressing these challenging topics with students, helping them find ways to make relevant connections today to social unrest and questions that we see around us. The responses from educators were overwhelmingly positive. One teacher commented that this series of workshops has been invaluable, and I thank each and every one of you. I plan on spending the rest of the summer gathering as many resources as possible so that I can make the necessary changes in the way we approach and teach history and other subject areas. So Brian, we thank you for this important work in the heritage area. We owe you a great debt of gratitude for all that you've done to help us with this, and we plan to continue this inspiring work into the future with your help. Brian? I'd like to thank Essex National Heritage for this award and for believing in the teaching hidden histories concept. Uh, bringing our hidden histories to the forefront and to the classroom helps us grow as a society and empowers um, young people to continue to strive to create a more critical, inclusive, and equitable society. I'd like to thank my students for advocating for this program and for pushing all of us to be better and to tackle the difficult and uncomfortable topics in our classrooms, schools, and communities. I can't thank my students enough for believing in the Hidden Histories program and for volunteering their time and participating in any demo lesson or sample lesson I asked of them. Even if it was on like a Sunday at like seven o'clock at night, they were willing to give up their time. Um, without them, there'd be no Teaching Hidden Histories program. 
I'd like to thank Beth um, for doing the 8,000 things that made it actually happen and in driving it forward. Um, I'd like to thank the National Parks Foundation for the funding. Uh, I'd like to thank Brad Austin, Sherry, um, all of our scholars, speakers, and teachers who took time out of their busy schedules to participate in this important work. Uh, the work done in these sessions sparked amazing discussions, helped jumpstart changes in classrooms, and highlighted the rich and, in some cases, overlooked histories in our communities. I connected with so many libraries and museums in Essex County during this process, but I'd especially like to thank the Lawrence History Center and the North Andover Historical Society for all of their help um, in compiling a lot of these resources. Um, I look forward to continuing this vital work in highlighting the rich and diverse history of Essex County. I'm looking forward to exploring new topics, finding different sources, and exploring some of the other rich stories that are awaiting in the many museums, historical societies, and libraries in Essex County. Uh, thank you. Again. So with that, I think we are at the end of the program, right? <laughs> so thank you so much for coming today. Uh, please fill out your match forms because we value your time. We do get some federal funds, but we have to match all of it, and your time, your volunteer time counts. So they're on the these pieces of paper. Please fill them out. Um, just sign your name, and we can fill out the number of hours. And take the Trails and Sales brochure. If you want more, we have plenty. Just let us know. We'd be happy to give you more. Pass them out. Tell people about it. And just thank you so much. It's so nice to see all of you in person. I hope we can do it again in the spring. <laughs>